afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Gen Train Wednesday lecture. My name is Mary Penley, and I'm taking uh, Terry Bloom's place because she's with family out of state. And I said, Terry, not to worry, we got it handled. So I'm happy to introduce our speaker. And just as a reminder, we do have our uh, schedule of Wednesday lectures in the yellow sheet, and then on the uh, current conductors available also on the table to my right. So. With that said, I will start with my introduction. Mike Clancy earned a BS in Oceanography from Florida Institute of Technology in 1973 and an MS in Meteorology from the University of Miami in 1975. He worked for Science Applications International in the late 70s and the Naval Research Lab in the early 80s. He joined the U.S. Navy's fleet numerical Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center blah, 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 in Monterey in 1983 and was selected as Technical and Scientific Director of FNMOC in 2005. Clancy authored over 100 publications in meteorology, oceanography, and information technology and received over 50 professional awards, including the Navy's highest civilian award, prior to his retirement from federal service in 2011. Clancy was inducted into the FNMOC Hall of Fame in 2015. He is a frequent public speaker on climate change and currently serves as chair of the Monterey County Chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Please welcome Mike Clancy. Well, thanks so much, Mary, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thanks so much for the wonderful hospitality here. I want to also thank uh, Terry Bloom for uh, inviting me. And um, you mentioned uh, joining Fleet America. I want to point out that the gentleman who actually hired me, Harry Nicholson, is right in the audience here. He's the guy that hired me and brought me to Monterey, changed my life for the better. And I also want to acknowledge my um, uh, fellow Fleet America Hall of Famer, Doug, Doug Winger, who's also in the room here. So it's great to see my former Fleet America colleagues here. I think I've spoken to this group uh, two or three times before. I think this is the, the second time I've been in this room. Uh, the others when we're online. It's a lot more fun to be here live in front of a live audience. I really appreciate being here. So the topic today is sea level rise, the most serious long-term consequence of climate change. And I hope by the end of this talk you'll understand what's behind that. Uh, so let me begin with some introduction and context here. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, temperature of the Earth from 22,000 years in the past to the present time. And what you see here is the last ice age. Recovery from the last ice age it takes about 10,000 years to come out of, a lot of, of an ice age. Here's the current Holocene War period. It's the beginning of human civilization here about 9,000 years ago. This little bump here is called the medieval warm period. This is called the little ice age. And finally, this red spike here is the post-industrial global warming that we are concerned with with regard to climate change. So let's zoom in on that red spike by looking at uh, global mean surface temperature of the Earth from 1850 to 2017 from five different highly credible sources. And they all paint the same picture, and the picture is as follows. Not much of a change from 1850 to 1880, slight decline from 1880 to 1910, fairly rapid warming from 1910 to 1945, slight cooling from uh, the mid-40s to about the um, early 70s, mid-70s, that was a result of aerosol, air pollution uh, in the, into the atmosphere reflecting the sun away and masking the effect of global warming in the post-World War II industrial era. Beginning in um, you know, the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, many laws were passed around the world and that brought air pollution down. And uh, global warming didn't return very strongly. You can see from the mid-70s to the present, there's been very strong upper warming says that we're now running about 1.2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Notice the zigs and zags here. It doesn't go up in a straight line. This is called climate variability, distinctly different from climate change, things like El Nino and La Nina and uh, that sort of thing. But I'm going to show you a video of one of those. And it's a video made from the NASA product. And uh, what we're going to be looking at here actually is going to be uh, temperature anomaly. And temperature anomaly is a fancy way of saying temperature difference from a reference field. And in this case, the reference field is a 1951 through 1980 average, 30 year average. And so here's the temperature scale off here. Oranges, the dark oranges are, are plus two degrees centigrade. 
the dark blues are minus 2 degrees centigrade. And I'll call out the decade and just watch the patterns. Pay particular attention to what happens in the mid-70s. So here we go. 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, 30s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, here come the 70s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s. And we end up at 2018. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things going on here. A couple of things are pretty apparent. One, um, the um, land is warming faster than the sea, about twice as fast. But the sea is warming. You see all these yellows throughout the world ocean. A couple places where it's cooling, that's kind of special cases. But on, on, on balance, the world is, the oceans are warming. The land is warming. The farther you go north, the more it warms. That's called Arctic amplification. It's warming about two to three times faster in the Arctic than other parts of the world. That doesn't happen in the southern hemisphere. It only happens in the northern hemisphere. And um, there are implications with that for sea level rise. We'll get to that later. So that kind of um, sets the stage here. Um, so what's going on there? Well, in fact, it is the greenhouse effect. I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with it, but just do a quick review here. What we're looking at here is the um, Earth's energy budget. And uh, this is average over the entire face of the Earth, averaged over night and day, average over all four seasons. In fact, this is average over a six-year period in terms of the numbers on here. On the left-hand side of the chart, we see the flow of solar, inter uh, solar uh, radiation, also, also known as shortwave radiation. And it, comes in from the sun, some is reflected from clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere, goes back out to space, some is reflected from the surface, particularly ice and snow areas. Some is absorbed by the surface, some is absorbed by the atmosphere. On the right-hand side, we see the emission of long-wave radiation, also known as infrared radiation. And uh, you know, what happens here is this infrared radiation is, is trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such that about 84% of the heat leaving this Earth's surface as infrared radiation actually comes back down and warms the Earth. So the greenhouse effect works like this. The Earth is warmed by incoming solar radiation, and it's cooled by reflected solar radiation and outgoing long-wave radiation. These greenhouse gases trap the outgoing long-wave radiation and warm the lower atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. And finally, human activities increase the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and increase the warming. And the greenhouse gases that are driving global warming in order of importance are um, CO2, carbon dioxide, CH4, methane. The F gases are fluorinated gases. These are man-made gases often used in refrigerants, for example, um, that involve the atom fluorine in the molecule. And finally, uh, nitrous oxide. So that's a quick review of um, of climate change. So what are the physical and natural consequences of this climate change? I'm just going to hit the high points here. Increasing frequency and intensity of severe storms, heat waves, and cold snaps. And free, increasing frequency and intensity of floods and wet regions. Increasing frequency of droughts and wildfires in dry regions like our region. Decreasing mountain snow packs and earlier, earlier snow melt. Big issue for us here in California since we get a lot of our summertime uh, water supply. Uh, from uh, the snowpack in the Sierra. Increase, increasing mortality of coral reefs, decreasing productivity, productivity of fisheries, increasing species migrations and extinctions with loss of biodiversity, and finally, sea level rise, what we're going to be talking about today. So here's a depiction of sea level rise. It's occurred um, from 1900 to 2017. So what we're looking at here on this axis is the global mean sea level rise in millimeters from 1900 uh, to 2017. The blue part here is derived from tide gauge data. Now tide gauge is an instrument that measures the water level, usually measures the tides. If you average out the tides, you get the sea level. There's a tide gauge on the wharf in Monterey, the tide gauge is all around the world. And so this, is a, the, this uh, part of the figure is derived from uh, tide gauge data. The red part here is derived from satellite altimetry data. There are these satellites up there that actually can measure sea level from space by bouncing the radar signal off the sea surface. Tracking the altitude of the satellite can actually measure the, the sea surface uh, very accurately. And what you see is from 1900 to 2017, uh, 
sea level has risen almost eight inches. Normal mean sea level has risen almost eight inches. But the real concerning thing here is that it's accelerating. You can see here from 1900 to 1930, it was increasing at the rate of about 0.6 millimeters per year. From 30 to 1992, it increased at 1.4 millimeters per year. From 1993 to 2017, about 3.1 millimeters per year, and then lately, less, um, you know, from, from 2010 on, about 4.1 millimeters per year. So it's increasing, it's accelerating, and that's a real concern. Now, another thing you should know about sea level rise, and this is not very intuitive, not many people really understand this, know about this, is that um, <coughs> sea level rise varies wi widely among different regions of the world. So what we're looking at here is the sea level change from 1993 to 2016, 2016 measured by these satellites I mentioned with names like Topex Poseidon and Jason 1 and Jason 2 and 3. These are the satellites to measure using the greater altimetry data. And here's the scale right here. Now during this period, um, the global mean sea level went up about 7.4 centimeters, which would be right out here someplace. And you can see some places it's rising much faster, some places it's rising slower. Uh, real concern is um, the area of Micronesia here in the western tropical Pacific. There's a lot of island nations there that are barely a meter above sea level, and yet the sea level is rising faster than any other place in the world, and their very existence is being threatened by that. Pretty good news story for California. Our sea level has is, is been rising about the same as the global meter, or, or less, a little bit less than the global meter. We'll probably continue to do that. Uh, rising faster along the eastern sea, more rising faster in the Gulf of Mexico here. But the real concern is the, is the western tropical Pacific and the effect on the island nations there. So, what are the factors affecting sea level? I'm going to kind of dig in here a little bit, and it makes sense to divide um, the factors relevant to, to changes in sea level into short-term issues and long-term issues. And um, most of the short-term uh, factors here really don't have anything to do with climate change, don't have a long-term trend to them, but they're very relevant to this problem because when you get damage, when your house is going to get washed in the sea or the road is going to be worn away or the cliff is going to collapse, it's really these short-term uh, effects coming into play on top of the long-term trend in climate change. So I want to talk a little bit about the short-term trends first, then we'll, then we'll get into the long-term climate change. So there are uh, sort of uh, four things here, tides, local weather, surf, and even tsunamis. I'm going to talk briefly about tsunamis, mainly just to be uh, sort of complete here. So let's talk about the tides first. Um, first of all, tides are the most obvious change in sea level. You go to the beach, you can see the tides. Everyone's is, is familiar with the tides. Tides are actually pretty complicated, though. They come in um, three different flavors, semi-diurnal, semi-diurnal mixed, and diurnal. Semi-diurnal tides are tides such that there's two, two equal highs and two equal lows every day. Every lunar day. And the lunar day is, is uh, 24 hours and 50 minutes. So for an area of, of semi-diurnal tides, every day you're going to see two highs, two lows, and every succeeding day they're going to come about 50 minutes later. Very, very common. Um, semi-diurnal mixed is very similar, except the two highs are on equal height and two lows are on equal height. That's the kind of tides we have here in California. The entire west coast of the U.S. has semi diurnal mixed highs, two unequal highs, two unequal lows per day. The entire east coast has uh, semi diurnal tides, which means two equal highs, two equal lows per day. And the final type, uh, not as common as diurnal, that's one high and one low every day. That's what happens in the Gulf of Mexico, one high and one low every day. Now, in addition to that, uh, you may have heard the term neap tides, spring tides. Even you might have heard Phrygian spring tides. I'm sure you've got king tides. So these, these terms have to do with the difference in how high the tide gets. Now, um, let's take a look at that. So spring tides occur when, they don't occur in spring. They, they can occur in spring, they do occur in spring. They occur, they, they occur in all months of the year. It has nothing to do with the season spring. It comes from the fact that tides are the highest, and, they, and uh, the ancients said that tides just sprung forward, or the current sprung forward from this event, and so they call it spring tides. And spring tides, the sun and the moon are aligned. So this, for example, would be um, a spring tide when there's a new moon. The moon is black. And you can see the gravitational effect of the sun and the moon are aligned. And this sort of depicts that. The white ball here is the, is the tidal height. 
And uh, the green here is that due to the moon, and this the orange here and or yellow here is due to the sun. You add the two together, and you get the highest tides when they're aligned together. The next tide is called the neap tide. The neap tide happens, that's the minimal uh, tide of the month. And that happens when uh, the Earth or the moon is in its first or third quarter. It's perpendicular to the sun, and so now the gravitational force of the moon and the sun are no longer aligned. And you still get a high tide, but it's not as high, so you get a low tide, it's not as low. Then you keep going around, and you get a full moon. And that's again a spring tide. And it's the highest tide of the month, along with the new moon tide. And the moon goes around, you get a neat tide, and that's again another uh, a slower or smaller tide, and finally you're back to um, the uh, full or the uh, new moon uh, spring tide. So, what about a Phrygian spring tide? Well, I'm sure you know that the moon goes around the Earth in an ellipse. It's not actually a perfect circle. And sometimes it's closer to the Earth than other times. You've probably heard that term, super moon. It's like when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. That's Phrygian spring tide. And that's what happens is it's when um, the moon is aligned up with the sun, but it's also close to the Earth because of this, just by the uh, by nature of things. And that this would be a new moon, Phrygian spring tide. This would be a full moon, Phrygian spring tide. Spring tides and uh, spring tides happen twice a month. Uh, neap tides happen twice a month. Phrygian spring times, tides happen six or eight times a year. So it's a fairly rare event. That's when you have the highest tides. And then finally, you've probably heard the term king tide. Well, you probably know that uh, the Earth goes around the sun, not a perfect circle, but an ellipse. And in the uh, wintertime, in January, for example, the Earth is closest to the sun. And so that's called a king tide, because the Earth is closest to the sun, the gravitational effect of the sun is the strongest. And so um, it goes like that. Now, if the Earth was a water planet, and there were no continents, and the ocean was completely flat, and the stratification of density was the same everywhere around this water planet, the tides would be really simple. But because the continents get in the way, because there's topography, there's you know, topography under the ocean, mountain chains and so forth, um, because the stratification of the ocean changes, it's really complicated. And you can see what we're looking at here is the amplitude of the M2 tidal constituent. That's basically how strong is that uh, slate iron ore component, which is the dominant tide. And you can see it varies widely. Uh, it's pretty much zero in the Gulf of Mexico, there are some of the iron ore ties there. It's, it's sort of moderately high here in California. It's much higher in the Gulf of Alaska. It's particularly high in uh, the Bay of Biscay here. And uh, here's an example of that. This is an example of the tidal range at uh, Camaray, France, in the Bay of Biscay. This is high tide, and this is low tide. Same boat, same location. This is a spring tide in, in Camaray. But at about 20 feet of vertical uh, change there. So tides are complicated, and they vary widely around the world. That's a little bit of a tutorial on tides. The next thing is local weather. Um, local weather has a big impact on sea level. For example, we get strong onshore winds that pushes the water up against the coast that makes the sea level rise. Blows for a long enough period of time, the Earth's rotation comes into play, it's a little more complicated. There's also something called the inverse barometer effect. When you get low pressure from a low pressure you know, storm coming over, um, you know, the low pressure here and high pressure far away just kind of pushes the water up and that can cause the water to rise about a foot or so. And just, just purely from the effect of the, of the pressure change, nothing to do with the wind. But generally, you're going to have wind on top of that. And rainfall. Rainfall can even cause, the, will in fact cause the, uh, the tides to rise. If you get uh, you know, a, a storm coming through and there's two or three inches of rain in a period of time over the ocean, well, guess what? It's going to raise a sea level a couple of inches. So all these things come into play. And the big one, of course, though, is storm surge. And here's an example of what storm surge will do for you. This is a picture of uh, Waveland, Mississippi, uh, after the passage of Hurricane Katrina. This was a neighborhood here. And there were homes, these were all home sites, all completely uh, wiped away. I think the storm surge was about 20 feet from Katrina. Uh, there are hurricanes that have been up around 12 to 15 feet. I think Katrina was probably the highest. So that's what storm surge can do for you, on top of all these other things. And uh, you know, when you're worried about a hurricane, particularly in Florida where I grew up, you really worry about um, when the hurricane comes, is it going to be hitting at high tide or low tide? That's a big deal. 
and so you're always keeping up that right? you should be able to look at that. And that kind of gets back to what I was talking about. All these things tend to come into phase. If you have you know, a Phrygian spring tide and a storm, and it's happening in January when the earth is close to the sun, then you're going to have the maximum price. And that's when you can worry about the you know, damage occurring on the surface. Next thing is surf. Um, even if there's no local winds, no local weather, but there's a huge storm you know, in the Gulf of Alaska, and we get a long period of swell coming here, and the surf is really large, the surf will cause the sea level rise because the surf actually, you know, long period waves actually do transport some water, I mean, a lot of some water, that piles up against the coast, and that causes the sea level rise. And of course, the pounding of the waves will cause erosion of cliffs and so forth. And here's a good example of this. Uh, this is a picture of Pacifica, California, right at the coast from us in January of 2016. Uh, all these buildings along the coast of Pacifica were, uh, had to be abandoned, and some of them uh, came in, made for some very dramatic footage, if you've ever seen that. You can see the big surf pounding up against the cliff here. And finally, tsunamis. You know, tsunamis are very rare events, but uh, you know, I, I, just for completeness, I feel like I had to talk about it. Just a quick couple of things on tsunamis. A couple things you should know about them. One is, uh, of course, they're caused by underwater earthquakes, but one thing you should know about that is they don't correlate very well. The, the strength of the tsunami, the height of the tsunami, doesn't correlate very well with the Richter scale of the earthquake. And that's because it really depends on how the bottom is moving. If the bottom is kind of shaking back and forth, there isn't a whole lot of tsunami potential. But if it's going up and down, or there's a collapse of the sea, the sea floor, then you're going to get a tsunami. The tsunami will travel across the entire ocean basin as a shallow waterway because the Period is so long, it's a long, low wave. If you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean, the tsunami passes under you, well, don't worry about the Poseidon, the Poseidon effect, you leave, forget it, that's not going to happen. You'll never even notice it. If it goes right under the ship, you won't even notice it. It's very long, and uh, you know, it's so long, you won't even notice it. But when it comes to shore, the leading edge starts to slow down as it hits shallow water, and then you get the problems with tsunamis. Now, Hollywood takes this big giant wave coming like this, you know, it's not nothing like that. Generally, it lifted. They come ashore as a series of waves, and then shortly thereafter, it takes on the, what I like to consider as being like a river flowing. It's like a river flowing in the big small river, which will move houses and trains and cars, and you know, it's very powerful. Here's a picture of um, the tsunami coming ashore at the Fukushima Aichi nuclear plant in March of 2011. You can see it's coming ashore as a series of waves, and then it just kept coming and coming like a river flowing. Miles and of course they're still dealing with the uh, still dealing with the um, with the aftermath of this uh, nuclear plant there. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of the short-term changes in, in uh, sea level, which have nothing to do with climate change except for the fact that we do expect storms to get stronger, including the storms that hit us here in California. But uh, climate change has nothing to do with tides, nothing to do with tsunamis. It may have something to do with surface storms get stronger. But really, in terms of, of, of the topic of this, of this lecture, we're really focused on the long-term rise of sea level. And the dominant issues that drive that are melting of the mountain glaciers, melting of the ice sheets to Greenland and the Arctic ice sheet, thermal expansion of the oceans, and terrestrial water storage, damming of rivers, actually reduces sea level. And there's a couple other things that come into play here, but they're, they're of smaller interest and a little bit esoteric. Kind of, kind of focus on these right here. So let's begin with melting of glaciers. This is two photographs of, of, of Newark Glacier in Alaska. The left is 1941, the right is 2004, taken from pretty much the same location. Here, here's this mountain here is that mountain there, and this headland here is that headland there, and this uh, part of the uh, structure here is right there. This is a great way to see with your own eyes the effect. And you can visit pretty much any glacier in the world. There's going to be a ranger station there, a lookout point like this. Inside, they're going to have a picture that was taken you know, decades ago. You're going to be able to compare that picture to what you see out the window, and it's going to look a lot like this. Uh, and, and in fact, melting of mountain glaciers has been the dominant contributor to sea level rise uh, for the last more than a century. The next issue are the melting of the ice sheets, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet. And um, if you remember that video we watched, the little book of the warming, we talked about the Arctic amplification of warming before you go north. Um, well, that's affecting Greenland, it's affecting the mountain glaciers, of course. And here's a good example of that. What we're going to look at here is a 
uh, video animation of the change in um, the Greenland ice sheet from 2002 to 2016. It's a 14 year period. Uh, observed from the GRACE satellites, that's the NASA Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment satellites. This uh, here shows you um, the time series of, of, uh, of massive ice that's lost. The upward uh, zigs here correspond to winter time when it grows a bit. The downward zags are summertime when there's a loss of ice. You can see you, know, you can see what the trend is going to be here. So let's take a look at this. So again, this is a 14-year period, and here's this is the uh, the colors will appear over Greenland here, and this will give you how much is lost. So dark orange should be a loss of four meters. So here we go. about these satellites, a really interesting satellite system, the way that they actually use gravity to measure this, and it's a very unique satellite system. As you can see, the tremendous loss of ice. So from 2002 to 2016, which is 14 years, um, 3.748 trillion tons of ice was lost from Greenland. And where did that ice go? Well, it melted and the water went into the ocean. And it was causing the sea levels to rise. And we'll see exactly how much of that later. The next one is thermal expansion of the oceans. We saw in that video that the oceans are getting warmer. And as the water warms, it expands. Ask any plumber about that. In fact, this is taken from the plumber's manual. And what we're looking at here is, uh, this is uh, trying to scale, this is a, a one a gallon container of water. At 70 degrees it looks like this, at 140 degrees it looks like that, at 180 degrees it's going to overflow. So as you warm water it expands. That's why plumbers are going to tell you for some of your water systems you need a, you need a, um, a thermal expansion tank because of this effect. Well as the oceans warm, um, the seawater sea water expands and that contributes to climate, or contributes in an important way to Sea level rise. And finally, a terrestrial water storage damming of rivers. Beginning about the uh, mid 50s through the early 70s, there were a large number of mega dams built around the world. And those dams, of course, hold the water back and normally, uh, from the precipitation of falling land, it would normally run back to the ocean. And suddenly you're, you're shifting water from, from the ocean to the land because of these huge, there's dozens of huge. Uh, and dams built. For example, this is a Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River in China, and this is pretty typical of, of the many mega dams which are around here. So, damming of, of rivers, this um, terrestrial water storage actually reduces sea level, goes counter to the other things. So, um, a couple other things come into play, not that important. I want to now talk about the cumulative contributions of the different things here. So, what we're looking at here from 19 to 2020, what we're looking at is the cumulative contribution of sea level rise in millimeters. So you can see begin about the middle of the last, middle of the 20th century, here about 1950, it was a pretty clear progression. Melting of the mountain glacier was by far the largest contributor to sea level rise, followed by melting of the Greenland ice sheet, with thermal expansion of the ocean kind of a distant third. It was really those three things going on. And now when we look here at close to uh, 2020, melting of the mountain glaciers is still by far the largest contributor, but thermal expansion of the ocean has come on strong and basically has roughly equaled the melting of the Greenland ice sheet um, because the ocean has really started warming. We saw that in that video. Beginning of the 70s, it really started warming fast, and that caused a strong upward trend of, of uh, warming. But here's the real concern. Melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. This is the sleeping giant coming away. The real concern is melting of, of the Antarctic ice sheet. That's, the Antarctic ice sheet has the largest store of fresh water in the world by far. Uh, it hasn't been a big contributor so far because most of the warming has been in the, in, in the Arctic. But as the whole planet gets warmer and warmer, you can see it's starting to melt and it's starting to accelerate here. The real concern is, um, is the Antarctic ice sheet, particularly after about 2050. Most of the models show that after 2050, melting of the Antarctic really becomes the big contributor to climate change. But right now, 
Uh, relative amount of measures is still number one. At some point, this will drop off because all the amount of measures will be gone. They'll be melted. And it'll be the ice sheets that are contributing and thermal expansion that are contributing. And the real concern is the Antarctic ice sheet. So, I want to talk now about dynamic ranges, sea level, just to kind of give you a feel for that. What I mean by dynamic range? That would be um, all of the highest possible sea level to the lowest possible sea level. What if we melted all the ice? How much sea level would we get? What if we went back into an ice age? Where would the sea level go? Well, um, here's reconstructed sea level over the past 24,000 years. And uh, this is a sea level change in meters. So zero is where we are right now. And you can see back about uh, you know, 22,000 years ago, we were uh, still in the last ice age. And the sea level was about 130 meters below where it is now. So that's a sea level 130 meters. That's like about 400 feet below where it is now. You'd be able to walk way out of the water again, way out of the floor of the water again, and it would be dry. And then, uh, you know, it came to here. What if we melted all the ice? What if the earth got warm enough and we melted all the ice? Now, that's happened a number of times in the past. I'm not predicting it's going to happen again. And the things that drove that in the past are not happening now. There are geological effects that were uh, characteristic of the ancient earth and the earth was geologically much younger. But uh, just, just to kind of set the range here, what if all the ice melted? Well, the answer is uh, the sea level would rise about as well. This is just to show why the sea level was low. There were these giant ice sh uh, sheets during the last ice age covering um, the continents and the water that rolled in the ocean was frozen in these, these ice sheets. When these ice sheets melted, the sea level rose back to where it is now. But anyway, um, where would the sea level go if we melted all the ice? Well, the answer is right about up here we would get about another 70 meters of sea level rise. So there's enough ice melt, there's enough ice, enough, enough fresh water and frozen ice to raise the sea level about 70 meters if you melt it at all. Not predicting that's what we have. So this brings up a really important point, and that is the time lag between warming Earth and rising sea. And this is why, this is kind of the, the basis for my, for my sort of provocative uh, title, the biggest concern from climate change. So let's take a look here. So this is the chart we were just looking at a minute ago, the graph we were looking at a minute ago. This is the sea level from 24,000 years ago to the current time. And I'm going to put below that another graph we looked at earlier. This is the temperature of the Earth. And I've brought them into uh, alignment here. So the current time lines up here right along this line. And 22,000 years ago lines up right along here. So you can see the relationship between warming Earth and rising sea level. So what you see from this is that um, the warming Earth, the Earth's temperature stabilized about 9,200 years ago, uh, right about here. But you can see that the sea level was still rising. In fact, the sea level rose about for about 2,500 years. It was still sea level rising. And it rose about 40 meters. So there is this long, long, long time lag between warming Earth and rising sea level. Why is that? Well, because it takes a long time for the ice sheets to come into thermal equilibrium with warming Earth, which is a very fancy way of saying it takes a long time for all the ice that's going to melt to actually melt, like a thousand years possible, and uh, potentially 40 meters of rise. So you can see there's this big, long time lag between warming Earth and rising sea level. Now, another way of looking at this is like this. Um, from the fossil record, from the geological record, we can go back and we can reconstruct the temperature of the Earth. We can also reconstruct um, sea level. And we can compare how high sea level got as a function of how warm the Earth was. So for example, um, the Earth about 125,000 years ago was about 1 degree centigrade. And the sea level ultimately got to a height of about 6 to 9 meters above where it is now. So if you think about that, we're about 1.2 degrees centigrade right now. What if we just stay right where we are? Well, uh, if history is, is a guide here, the sea level will continue to go up, maybe six or nine meters. Uh, three, three million years ago, the Earth's temperature was between two and three degrees centigrade, which is where I think the Earth is going to be by the end of this century. My prediction, which I've made many times, as, as some people know, is that uh, by the end of the century, we're going to hit about 2.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial, which is well, way above the Paris Accord. That would be in this range here. So that would be six meters to who knows where. 
you know, a lot of uncertainty here, but if you just split the difference, it could be you know, 20 or 25 meters. And that's really serious. Now, of course, that could take 2,000 years to get there. And maybe human civilization is able to adapt over 2,000 years to rise the sea levels of that magnitude, which means basically you're, um, you're basically uh, abandoning all the major coastal cities of the world and probably having to relocate about a third of the world's population. Maybe you can do that over 2,000 years, but it sounds like it would be pretty, pretty difficult to do. So let's take a look at sea level rise projections. And um, these projections go from 1900 uh, all the way out to the year 2300. And there, uh, there, there are three different projections here. The, the color shading here indicates uncertainty, flood uncertainty, and, and any flood prediction is particularly large flood uncertainty in sea level prediction. So you can see the error bars are pretty large. And you have to make assumptions about what are going to be the greenhouse gas emissions scenarios here. So for the high emission scenario, this is called RCPs, it's something I come across as representative concentration of coast This is a term that the IPCC, the government for climate change, used to use about different kind of emission scenarios. This has sometimes been referred to as business as usual. This would be if we don't try to do anything to constrain greenhouse gas emissions, where would we go? Well, the answer is by the year 2300, up here close to four meters of sea level rise. By 2100, we'd be up here about 1.5 meters of sea level rise. And, uh, you know, RCP 2.6 would be um, bringing emissions down to zero by 2100. That would um, put us in the zone of meeting the Paris Climate Accord. We're not, we're not in that zone right now. We're, we're not anywhere close to meeting that. But if we did that, um, sea level rise would be held to below a meter. But notice that even then, it's still going up. It's going to go up for a long period of time. Well, my prediction is right here. Uh, this is the uh, prediction that correlates most strongly with um, 2.5 degrees centigrade warming by the end of the century. And this says that uh, by the um, by 2100, we would be in the range of about 0.5 to 1 meter roughly sea level rise. And by and it keeps on going up. And by the year 2300, uh, about uh, two meter, about one to two meters roughly. So that's, that's pretty serious. So for closing comments, I'm going to um, call on my friends at the Surfire Foundation and a couple other folks here to talk about uh, the impact of sea level rise on California. Uh, the big, as you'll see in this video I'm going to show, the big concerns in California are the impact on beaches, particularly the loss of beaches, the loss of coastal access, uh, the impact of that on tourism, on lifestyle on the coast of California. So let's take a look at this. biggest threats to coastal access in the next decades really is sea level rise and the effects of that, our beaches washing away. That's going to be one of our biggest challenges for our coastal communities is really how do we navigate that while ensuring that the public still has access to these spaces. I sit on the board of this organization called the San Onofre Parks Foundation and we're watching sea level rise happening on certainly a yearly basis and I keep thinking that if this beach is here in 10 years I'll be surprised. The state now is calling it a crisis, the coastal crisis. Our knee-jerk reaction as sea levels rise and coastal storms increase is to armor our coast with seawalls and rock revetments and unfortunately that blocks the natural processes that our coasts otherwise would be taking in order to respond to our changing coastal conditions with climate change and sea level rise. And those cities that have critical facilities and housing on their coast are really going to feel it. We do have some of that. We have some of our critical city facilities on the coast. They may have to move. At a certain point you can't guard it with a wall. The ocean's going to come and get it. You have something that's known as the coastal squeeze, where you're developing all along the coastline. And with that hard structure, you're blocking the natural transport of sediment. And that transport of sediment is what helps the beaches to nourish and maintain themselves. 
you all of a sudden have a situation where beaches are disappearing. Parts of Ventura County, Santa Barbara County, certainly uh, Los Angeles County, people are right up on the ocean and when the ocean's coming, it's gonna take out those houses. It's already taking out the highway. If you look at some of the projections for climate change and sea level rise, we could lose a third or more of our beaches. That means we could also lose a third or more of our surf breaks. By and large, Californians want to preserve their public beaches into the future. And sometimes that's at odds with residential homeowners. They don't want to be told they might have to move one day. If you don't do managed retreat, you're going to lose it anyway. So let's think about it. A lot of people think putting up rocks or armoring the coast is going to be the resolution. At some point, that actually hurts your ability to save your facilities. It's going to come down. So maybe not tomorrow or in 10 years, but it's going to come down. So we have to think of the future in all of these things we do. The question is, can we adapt to some of these big challenges? Can we adapt to the need to change how we manage our human affairs on the coast, our roads, our train lines, our hotels and motels, our private residences, our campgrounds? Can we figure out ways to equitably change? Can we reduce our carbon emissions so that sea level rise is not as dramatic as these worst case scenarios which assume that everything goes on as business as usual. I think it's clear that you know on all these levels business as usual cannot continue if we want to protect the California coastal environment and ecosystems and ensure access for all. Everybody is going to have to come to terms with the fact that in the coming years we're all going to have to let go of things that we love, whether that's private property or that's public coastal commons. So these are very, very difficult questions. This is some of the most valuable real estate in the world, not just in terms of the financial value of that real estate, but the emotional, the cultural, the historical, the family value. Our identity as Californians the coast is part of that, even if we don't live by the coast. The whole concept of sea level rise, it's really difficult for someone to understand if they don't have a connection to the beaches and these areas that will be affected by it. But once they can see for themselves that this beach, in fact, will be greatly diminished or even lost, that then moves something inside of them to want to make a difference and to act. I don't think the coast is going away but it's changing and it's going to change dramatically and how we as Californians deal with that is going to determine the future of coastal environments and coastal access. The Arctic is warming much faster than the Antarctic, and why is that? Well, there's a feedback loop called the snow ice feedback loop, which amplifies global warming. And the way that works is, uh, as the Earth warms, um, ice tends to melt, particularly sea ice. And when that ice melts, it leaves behind a much darker ocean. Ice is highly reflective; it reflects the, the sun back out, gives a cool air. But when it melts, it leaves back ocean. It leaves behind ocean, which is very dark and absorbs heat energy from the sun. That happens very strongly in the Arctic because the Arctic is, is uh, the North Pole is covered by the, has, is covered by the Arctic Ocean and uh, the ice cap there in fact is sea ice and when that melts back in the summertime it, uh, it, it, it produces that warming effect. In the southern hemisphere you don't have that. The South Pole you've got a continent, you have, the, you have Antarctica and you're not going through that cycle of, of ice melting from leaving behind the dark ocean. You have a little bit of ice around the periphery of Antarctica but it's nothing like in, in the Arctic where you have that big giant um, Arctic Ocean and when the ice melts at least behind the dark ocean which then absorbs much more heat. So the Arctic is warming about two to three times faster than the global average. 
the analytic is kind of moving in the same as the Yes? Can you talk a little bit about ocean acidification? Yes, ocean acidification. The question is, can we talk a little bit about ocean acidification? Well, as um, CO2 levels are going up in the atmosphere, they are also going up in the ocean. Uh, generally speaking, as the ocean is warm, you would expect CO2 to be outgassed from the ocean in the atmosphere because as the water gets warmer, it's harder for the gas to stay in the atmosphere in the, in the water and it tends to escape. But it turns out the concentrations are growing so rapidly in the air above the ocean that it's overcoming that effect and the CO2 levels are in the, in the ocean are going up. Well, um, when CO2 is in the ocean, it, it interacts with water to form um, uh, carbonic acid. And that tends to make the ocean tend more towards the acidic side of the pH scale. Uh, taking you back to your high school chemistry, chemistry, there is that pH scale, which runs from you know, 0 to, I think, 14 or something like that. Uh, 0 being battery acid and 14 being drain cleaner. And uh, 7 is neutral, that's, you know, uh, distilled water. The ocean is actually on the basic side of neutral. It's in about the eighth range. But uh, as the CO2 levels are going up, it's trending more towards the, the um, acidic side. And what that does is it causes, um, it causes problems for marine calcifers. These are um, you know, marine organisms that form a, a calcium shell. And uh, because that increasing acidification, um, particularly um, you know, uh, when they spawn, they have a hard time forming their, their shells, and as a result, that's causing a big problem for uh, marine calcifers, including coral reefs. That's one of the contributing factors to coral bleaching. Coral bleaching dying off of coral reefs, about 20 percent of the world's corals that died off uh, are affected by um, ocean acidification, but also ocean warming. As the temperatures get too warm, the corals can cancel off. Who else? Yes? Olive brand was uh, a mean sea level of the Olive was mean sea level of well, it's a moving target, actually. I can't give you any one time you know, uh, location or, or time frame. A mean sea level is, is a moving target. You know, people will typically uh, take a record for about 10 years in a particular location and call that mean sea level. But you know, you've seen how the sea level is changing here, so the mean sea level is, is constantly changing. There are various international agreed to standards that come out you know, every you know, 10 or 20 years. But um, those are all subject to change as, as sea level is changing. So it's a moving target. Yes? Very impressive. You see what you have to Anything hopeful? Yes, I can. No matter what we humans do, the Earth is going to be just fine. We can have nuclear war tomorrow, wipe out all humans in the Earth. And who knows? That might happen. We talked to Vladimir Putin. He, he put his nuclear forces on alert. and. He's threatened us, and who knows? But the fact of the matter is, the Earth will be just fine. Now, it's going to take maybe 10 or 20 million years before the Earth will recover from that. And, you know, we humans won't be here. But the Earth will be just fine. It'll recover just fine. The radioactivity will go away, and the climate change will be all right. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of being facetious here. Well, the fact of the matter is, I'm, I'm optimistic about two things. I'm optimistic about the technology. Uh, there's, there's technology out there that's um, right, available right now that we can use to solve this problem. We have time. The, time, the science tells us we have the time and the technology to halt climate change by the end of this century. Unfortunately, we're not moving fast enough to do it because we lack political will and political power to do it. But I am optimistic about technology, and it's improving all the time. There's innovation going on all the time. Um, you know, new sources of power, new ways of, of building electric vehicles, new materials, lots of things are happening. Things we haven't even dreamed of are going to be invented at some point are going to help us deal with this problem. That's one thing I'm optimistic about. The second thing I'm optimistic about are the young people, young people, the, the millennial generation. And uh, I was just out last night uh, with the Citizens Climate Lobby, a group I belong to here. We were out uh, doing uh, some uh, advertising on uh, Alvarado Street at the um, farmer's market, passing out some material talking about climate change. And I can tell you there's a strong correlation between the number of people who express an interest and an age. You know, the younger people are really interested. Millennials understand that's going to really impact them. Much more that's going to impact our generation. And so uh, they're getting it right. I'm also, I don't have the slides handy, but if you look at the trends in um, public opinion about uh, climate change, they're going in the right direction. 
And in fact, um, if you looked at, um, you know, I'm trying to remember the numbers. The number of people, the percentage of Americans who believe, who understand that um, climate change is, is real, that it's happening, you know, global warming is occurring, is uh, up around 67%, you know, and the people who say no, it's not happening is way down around 30%, or something the middle, you know, kind of, and don't really know. So that's about two to one. If you went back 20 years, you could lower that number by about 20%, but it would have been about 47%. So the trend is going in the right direction. There's an upper bound. It's never going to get to 100%. But it's, it's, at least it's going in the right direction. And eventually, our political leaders will catch up on that. And we'll see, we'll see more action. Yes, ma'am? Can you comment on the Supreme Court's decision regarding the EPA and what other people are going I think it's pretty bad. I haven't really had time to dig into it. And uh, actually, we're having a, a citizens' climate lobbying meeting on Thursday evening. And that's one of the topics we're going to be talking about. Um, I think it's more than just climate. I think that I'm pretty sure the Supreme Court decision was broad enough that it basically tried to rein in um, pretty much all government um, government regulation. And it's basically saying, you know, you're overstepping your bounds, you know, on government agencies. It has to be explicitly stated by Congress, do this, do that, or else you can't do it. And that's that's pretty, that's pretty very fundamental. And it'll affect more than just climate. It'll, it'll affect just about everything where government has a regulatory role. Uh, in terms of climate, it really hits the, um, the, um, the ability of, of government really constraining um, power plants emissions. And um, that's a real problem. Um, so I, I don't quite know exactly how that's going to play out. You know, I think I think Congress has the ability to override that, and but they have to, you know, have the will and the, the votes to be very explicit and the time to be explicit about, you know, do this, do that, and that's a stretch to imagine that, that that's going to happen. So that's a real concern about that. Yes, Wilson. Yes, sir. Are there any occasions for cruel currency or something like that? Because you know, you know, Absolutely. In fact, um, the. Um, a bit, one of the big changes occurring is, is in the Gulf Stream system. You know, the Gulf Stream is actually weakened about 15 percent from about the, the, early, the 1950s when we first started making measurements of the Gulf Stream to now. Did you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question would be, what are the impacts on um, ocean currents from climate change, including sea level rise? And I mentioned particularly the Gulf Stream system. The Gulf Stream has weakened about 15 percent. Uh, since the early 1950s when we first measured the Gulf Stream and now. And that's because um, there's a certain circulation pattern called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And it's kind of the tail end of the Gulf Stream. It allows the water that comes up from the Gulf Stream to sink down and form a complete loop. Part of the ocean is thermohaline circulation. I don't want to go too much detail there. But as the water, or as the ice is melting from Greenland, the ice sheet, a lot of fresh water is mixing with the Gulf Stream after it leaves Cape Hatteras and, you know, in that region. And it's making it difficult for it to complete that loop of the periodontal uh, return circulation. As a result, the Gulf Stream is weakening. And that actually contributes to sea level rise along the East Coast. Because it turns out that um, sea level in northern hemisphere slopes down, particularly to, perpendicular to ocean currents. It's the other way around in the southern hemisphere. It has to do with force rotation and balance of forces like that. And as the Gulf Stream weakens, uh, that will cause the sea level to rise along the eastern seaboard faster than the than the large, also along the Gulf Coast. So that's a real that's a real concern. Yes sir. Is there any scientific theory geoengineering that would explain the temporary weakness of the Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I gave a, a series uh, a couple weeks ago and I did talk about geoengineering. Um, you know uh, geoengineering is well, for, the question is, is it time to, to talk to do any geoengineering? So what's geoengineering? Geoengineering, most of the geoengineering proposals have to do with trying to change the Earth's albedo, trying to increase the amount of solar radiation reflected out of space. And it turns out if we could just change the Earth's albedo by 1%, we just make the Earth more reflective by 1%, that could solve the global warming problem, because that, that's enough cooling that would actually fix this problem. So that's kind of a motivating factor here. So people are proposing various ideas to do that. Things like putting mirrors up in space. Sounds crazy, but maybe not. You know, mylar mirrors and probably wear anything to play up in space. 
increase the price albeit by one percent, maybe. Um, getting cheaper and cheaper to launch things in space, and maybe we could do that. Um, another idea is putting uh, particulate matter up into the stratosphere, either through um, uh, jet airplanes flying up there or even tethered balloons. That will definitely cool the Earth. There's no doubt about that. We have experience in that. And we have major Earth, or major um, volcanoes, and they put lots of volcanic ash up in the stratosphere. That causes cooling. There was the famous um, year without a summer after Mount Tambora uh, erupted, and I think it was about around 1820. And they were cooled quite a bit for a year or two, and then eventually it settles out. The problem there is, the problem really with all geoengineering proposals are, number one, scalability. You know, can you really put enough stuff, do enough stuff that have an impact there? Two, cost. And three, unintended consequences. And a good example of that is putting particular matter up in the atmosphere. Eventually it settles down, and uh, you end up breathing it, you know, just like air pollution. And so that's not a good thing. And there are a lot of other issues, too. There's, there's one project called Cloud Whitening. Um, and I think the uh, project is based up at the University of Washington. I believe they've done some experiments off of Monterey. And the idea there is to pump uh, salt crystals from the surface of the ocean, from the surface ocean water, up into the base of the marine stratus clouds off our coast here. And that will call, change the particular, the, uh, change the drop size of the clouds and make them more reflective, and actually make them lighter. And that will increase the solar radiation reflected back up to Earth. That's probably the one that's most likely to happen. There are others like trying to put bubbles on the surface of the ocean, drone ships up there that would aerate you know, the surface of the ocean, put bubbles there and make it more reflective. Uh, you know, you're you're going to maybe do some genetic engineering of plants to make them more shiny, more reflective. Maybe you're going to paint all the roofs white. So you're going to paint things white and make it more reflective. Only about 1%. But uh, quite frankly, a lot of people are concerned about the whole idea of geoengineering from the standpoint. Um, we don't want people to think that there's a silver bullet out there. There's a geoengineering silver bullet so we can keep on burning fossil fuels, we can keep on drilling. That someone will invent some geoengineering and will solve this problem. I can tell you right now it's not going to happen. Doesn't mean they might not be worthwhile doing some of these things as part of the solution. My personal opinion is the research should go on, but I'm pretty skeptical that they're going to be very, very much of a major player. The main thing we need to do is we need to stop burning fossil fuels. We need to stop bringing fossil fuels out of the earth, and we need to stop burning them, and we need to switch to clean energy. And there's other things we need to do, too, but that's the main thing. What else? Yes? Uh, Mike, since you're a Navy reporter, do yes. you have any maps or charts showing potential impact of sea level rise in Florida? Sea level rise in Florida. Um, well, I do, but I'm not going to try to find them. And um, you know, there, you know, I, 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 I do have, I did get some charts that showed the impact of 70 meters of rise, which would be what would happen if all the ice melted. And I don't want to show them because they, 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 they're too scary. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's thousands of years away. That it happens. Uh, but I can tell you that um, um, South Florida, particularly the Miami area, is being threatened right now. They, they've got lots of problems right now. They have, they have what's called um, fair weather flooding where the roads are over water. And we talked about the tides and the bridging spring tide and all that kind of thing. Well, when that happens down there, a lot of the roads are flooded. Uh, people are, you know, getting up real tight and moving to higher ground. There's not much high ground down there. I can tell you New Orleans is in real trouble, for sure. The state of Louisiana in general. Northern Gulf Coast in general, particularly New Orleans. As you probably know, much of New Orleans is below sea level now. And they have a levee and a pump system to keep the water out. Um, my prediction is one more Katrina and New Orleans is gone. Yeah, I think there's going to be half, there's going to have to be a discussion. Do we really want to spend a couple hundred billion dollars to rebuild New Orleans, and it's just going to happen again in 20 years? And I think the answer is someone is going to become no, and you're going to relocate New Orleans someplace else. Um, so those are the two um, main areas. I think those are the two big areas. Uh, worldwide, Bangladesh is a big problem. You know, Bangladesh is kind of ground zero for sea level rise. A good uh, rule of thumb here is a one meter rise in sea level, which is, you know, in the realm of what will happen by the end of this century, will displace about 100 million people in the world. Um, and about half, about 30 million in Bangladesh alone. A two, million, two, a two meter rise will displace about 200 million people. Where are they going to go? And are there going to be people that are welcoming with open arms? You know, I don't think so. So that contributes to a lot of instability and lots of problems there. So that's another reason why. The sea level rise is such a big issue because it, you know, it, climate change in general um, really gets to the basics of life, and that's food, water, and living space. 
food and water because of the changing drought patterns and changing weather patterns that make it harder to uh, you know, have crop plants be productive. Living space because sea level rise pushes people up. You know, those 30 million people in Bangladesh, they're not going to India. You know, India's got a wall there, machine guns that shoot them, they try to cross the border. They're not going to Myanmar, same thing. Where are they going to go? So it's a humanitarian crisis that can contribute to instability in the world. And there are many other examples where climate change will contribute to instability in the world. Uh, good news, what's good news? Climate change alone, climate change alone is not going to bring about the end of human civilization. It's going to take World War III to do that. And, but climate change will make World War III more likely because it will bring about more um, friction in the world, more stress between, between countries, and um, you know, it's going to be hard to deal with. Right now, we're seeing you know, climate refugees, which contribute to instability in the world, contributes to the rise of autocratic leaders. You know, what do autocratic leaders talk about? You know, refugees coming across the border. Why are a lot of them doing that? Well, because of climate change. And a lot of the refugees that are flooding into Europe from North Africa and from the Middle East, because that huge drought is there, they can't, they can't make that as farmers. A lot of the people that are coming from Central America and Mexico into our country, they can't make it as farmers there anymore because the drought has just made it not viable. So, uh, you know, they contributes to all those things. What else we got? But the Earth is going to be just fine. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much.